Today is the 22nd Sunday after Pentecost. It's also a day within the Feast of the All Saints Day, so the second oration, secret and post-communion we pray at Mass today, comes from All Saints Day. The epistle upon we read for today's Mass is taken from St. Paul's epistle to the Philippians. Brethren, we are confident in the Lord Jesus, that he who hath begun a good work in you will perfect it unto the day of Christ Jesus. As it is meet for me to think this for you all, for that I have you in my heart, and that in my bonds, and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers of my joy. For God is my witness, how I long after you all in the love of Jesus Christ. For this I pray, that your charity may more and more abound in knowledge and in all understanding, that you may approve the better things, that you may be sincere and without offense unto the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of justice through Jesus Christ, unto the glory and praise of God. And the Holy Gospel. This gospel taken from St. Matthew, chapter 22, verses 15 through 21. At that time, the Pharisees went and consulted among themselves how to ensnare Jesus in his speech. And they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art a true speaker, and teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou dost not regard the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what dost thou think? Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their wickedness, said, Why do you tempt me, ye hypocrites? Show me the coin of the tribute. And they offered him a penny. And Jesus saith, saith to them, Whose image and inscription is this? They say to him, Caesar's. Then he saith to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Thus are the words of today's Holy Gospel. Render to God the things that are God's. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. In the Gospel for today's Mass, we see the proud and disobedient Pharisees consulting among themselves as to how they might trap our Lord. So deciding on a plan, they send their disciples to him. And they set their trap with flattery, as evil men often do. Master, they said to him, we know that thou art a true speaker. They would teach us the way of God in truth. Tell us, therefore, what does thou think? Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? So the question they ask is for a very specific reason. If Christ said it is not lawful to give to Caesar, they would denounce him to the Roman authorities. And if he said it was lawful, they would denounce him to the people as one who did approve of the Roman occupation of their territory. Well, either way, whatever the answer was, they could use it against him. But of course, our Lord being God, seeing their thoughts and knowing their scheme, exposed their evil intention and then gave, him his, answer. They gave his answer. He said to them, Why do you tempt me, ye hypocrites? So he put them on notice. He knows their evil intention. And then he said, show me the coin of the tribute. And then they offered him a denarius. Many times it's in English translation, it says it's a penny. But our Lord, of course, said, whose inscription is it and whose image? And they couldn't fail in responding. So they probably sensed that they, the hunters, were about to be trapped by the prey. And they responded to his question. Caesar's. It is the image of Caesar and his inscription. And then Christ spoke those words that everybody knows and which have been repeated millions of times since that day. To render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. The words spoken by our Lord that day are full of great meaning. Countless books have been written about them. Today I direct your attention to the second half of Christ's command. Render to God the things that are God's. To fully comprehend these words, we must consider the fact of creation. We must understand that the universe and everything in the universe have been created by God out of nothing. God, therefore, owns all things. He owns them. He is the Lord of all things. The world is his, and so is man. 
We belong to him. He made us and sustains us in our existence. He has given us our purpose. He has assigned to us an eternal destiny. He commanded the things that we must do to fulfill this destiny, that destiny of glorifying him and attaining our own eternal happiness. And therefore, man does not tell God what to do, as we have in the modern world today, but God tells man what to do. God tells us what we are to do when we obey him. We have the power, of course, to disobey him by the misuse of our free will. But we do not have the power to avoid the consequences of disobedience. That is why there is a, both a heaven and a hell. God commands us because he has a right to command us. And of all his commands are the fruit of his infinite knowledge and his wisdom and his love. But again, man is free to disobey him because it's an abuse of man's free will. But in doing so, man is not free to avoid hell. We should therefore be able to see that at the very heart and soul of our life and salvation is a great question. And it's a question of obedience or disobedience. We may say that at the root of all evil in the world and in the universe itself, from the beginning of time to this present, is found in disobedience, the refusal of angels and men to obey their creator. In like manner, we can say that at the root of all that is good in creation, from the beginning of time to the present, is true obedience. In the first moments of their creation, Lucifer and one-third of the angels refused to obey God. Lucifer, the greatest of angels, cried out, I will not serve. And one-third of the angels followed him in his disobedience. And then came the fall of Eve and then that of Adam. Both disobeyed God and brought into the world physical and moral evil. In the light of these things, it's not hard to understand that the redeem, to redeem the fallen human race of man, an act of obedience was necessary. But it had to be one of infinite value. And for this reason, we read in the book of St. John, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, God, to become a man and to be obedient. And by his obedience, he would atone for the disobedience of mankind. The Son of God loved us so much that in obedience to his heavenly Father, he laid down his life for us. In the epistle of St. Paul to the Philippians, St. Paul emphasizes the wondrous obedience of God, the Son to God the Father. He tells us that although he was God, Christ emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, he humbled himself, becoming obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. In light of such loving obedience for our sakes, how can we allow the seeds and the weeds of disobedience to take root in our souls? If we would render to God the things that are God's, we must first render obedience, obedience to him. And we must cultivate the spirit of obedience in every aspect of our lives, according to our state in life. We must get it through our heads, so to speak, to think, to understand. To be like Christ, that is to be Christ-like, requires obedience. That is one of the central reasons why the Protestant Reformation is so evil. The Protestant Reformation said that man can be saved by faith alone without obedience to the laws of God. Hundreds of millions of people believe that today. And what a clever deception of the devil it is. And while we are not deceived by such a false doctrine, we are sometimes deluded into thinking that we can go through life living in and out of mortal sin and expecting through our presumption that we will not save our souls. And this is not confidence, it's tempting. It's tempting God, and we must take God seriously. We must take God at his word. What we sow, we will reap. 
if we receive the sacraments regularly and faithfully, if we strive to fulfill the duties of our state of life, if we are faithful to our prayers, to the rosary, and to devotion to the sacred heart, if we avoid the occasions of serious sin, then yes, we may have great confidence that our Lord and Our Lady will not allow us to lose our souls. But our Lord said at the Last Supper, He's very, very clear in what's necessary for us. He says, if you love me, then he must be the first love of our life. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And then to make it very clear, as clear as possible, in that very same chapter of St. John, he goes on to say, he says, if you keep my commandments, you love me. If we do this, we will fulfill the command that he gave to us today, render to God the things that are God's. And for our obedience, our obedience to God proves something of our heart. Our obedience to God proves our love. How much do we love God is measured by our obedience to his commands. If we are obedient to his commands and we live our lives according to that command and our obedience, we can be assured we will gain for ourselves the reward, the reward of eternal life. May God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.